Today's scripture reading comes from Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We're still on that brief hiatus before we go back to uh, 2 Peter, when I get back in a couple of weeks. Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Jesus Christ and and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If If someone else thinks they have reason... To put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. And as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead." Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press onward to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took for me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal and win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. (sighs) So Friday, I had David, Lorraine, and Scotty show up because we were going to balance the sound out here because it's just been bothering me. Lobby speakers. We spent money on them. I want them to work. We did it. Sounds great. Sounds really, really good. Then that happened. And I still don't know why it happens. I've got theories and guesses, but I couldn't tell you. I took so much pride in the work that I did on Friday, and I'm really frustrated right now. Do you ever feel like, oh, like, just you, you work really hard at something and it just doesn't come together or just you can't quite figure out why it's still broken or what's wrong with it? Drives me nuts. But such is life. Last week, I talked about celebration. And if you were paying attention to the passage I just read, I'm going to link what I just said to what I'm saying now. You're wondering why, last week, I said, make sure you go and celebrate wins for people. When they accomplish something, tell them they did. Celebrate it with them. Encourage them. And now this week, all that effort's garbage and worthless in the light of knowing Christ. can feel like whiplash. Promise it's not. What I said last week still stands. Please always celebrate wins victories and accomplishments with one another. It is so important to do that. However, make sure your priorities are aligned correctly. Because if those accomplishments become things in which we take refuge, we rely and lean on the things that we've done and the, uh, the wins that we've had, and those become a source of who we are. You know, the guy who can fix the cars the best or the guy who can build stuff or the the lady who built the greatest home, whatever, whatever pride you might find in things. If we value those more than knowing Christ, that's a problem. And we're going to go over why that's a problem here in a minute. But I wanted to open with the sound stuff, which I was going to do anyways before the screen messed up. Because for me, this is a recent source of victory that I had where I felt like, We worked together, we sat down, we figured it out, we got things balanced right. Like, how many of you actually heard Lorraine today on the speakers? Fixed her. Fixed the problem. We can hear her now. I don't know if you like that or not, Lorraine, truthfully, but too bad. 
I wanted to hear you because it bothered me. But if I put too much stock and value in the, I figured out how to work the electronic soundboard and not enough in the important matters, that's a problem because those things fade or they break again. And there's nothing to do but to try again. So let's jump into the text here today and let's figure out what Paul is talking about. So first, as a brief kind of where he's been, Paul is currently in jail as he's writing this letter to the Philippian church, who are also suffering. This church, we believe, was very poor. They did not have a lot in the way of money or finances, and yet Paul more than once praises them for their support, both through prayer and financially. And he has just written about two people, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Timothy's doing great, don't worry. He's fantastic. In fact, he's the guy who just brought you the letter, so don't worry about him. But you heard, and Paul's heard that you heard, about Epaphroditus and how Epaphroditus got really ill and almost died. And I know that you're worried about them, writes Paul, but don't worry, he's fine now. And in fact, he was so touched and distressed over your concern for him that he wanted to make sure that I told you he's okay. So thank you for your prayers and thank you for your support. And so we come now to chapter 3, where Paul continues to say, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to read the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Why is it a safeguard for them? And this is what he says. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Now, if you're like me and you read the Bible, you can notice that hopefully you all read the Bible. That's not what I meant by being like me. <laughs> I'm tired. There's a lot going on tomorrow. Um, if, if you read the Bible and you, you can pick up on patterns, and if you notice in all of Paul's letters, they all largely start the same. I, Paul, I'm written, writing to you on behalf of Jesus, who's given me this uh, burden to be your apostle, and writing to you grace and peace. But if you've ever read the book of Galatians, you'll notice... It starts very differently, where Paul opens by saying, Paul, not sent by man nor by men, but by God alone. And then immediately after his opening says, I can't believe that you've screwed up so bad. Every other letter that Paul writes follows that opening greeting with, I praise God for you. Because I have heard of your faithfulness, or I've heard of your service, or I've heard of your dedication and hard work to the mission, no, but with Galatians, he opens with, why are you screwing up so bad? Because what was happening at the time is a big conversation was happening in the first century church about what to do with this new group of people who joined the church, those pesky Gentiles. You see, up until now, we put ourselves back in the first century, it's just been the Jews. I guess the Sumerians are there too. But they're like, they're like half-brothers, right? We didn't like them, but God kind of made it clear that we have to like them, so we're tolerating them. But these Gentiles, they don't even circumcise their sons. They don't eat kosher foods. They don't make sacrifices to God. They don't celebrate in our festivals. They're weird, and they're different. How do we handle weird and different in the church? And there were two schools of thought. You had Paul and Barnabas, and some others like him. And then you had a group known as the Judaizers. Let me read to you from Acts chapter 15. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs taught by Moses, so Old Testament law. All like, so when you're circumcised according to Moses, that means you're not just being circumcised, you're also being adopted into Israel in Jerusalem, and Judaism as a whole, which means you have to start following kosher laws and fabric laws and sacrifice laws, the whole nine yards. You don't just get circumcised and call it a day. If you are circumcised into the law of Moses, you are circumcised into everything, all 600 plus laws that are in the Old Testament in the first five books of the Bible. So this is what they were teaching them. Unless you are... Uh, circumcised according to, the cust according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Imagine if I got up here and said that. Unless you 
show up to church every Sunday, are showing me the progress report on reading your Bible, and are doing daily prayers, you can't be saved. And this caused a big dispute, a fight, between Paul and Barnabas and others like them and these Judaizers. So much so that they left the church at Antioch and headed south to Jerusalem, where the main church was still located, and sat everyone down and said, listen, we can't possibly agree on this. Either you have to become a Jew to become a Christian, or it's fine to stay as a Gentile and still be a follower of Christ. And it brought in such a huge disagreement that the apostles and elders had to consider this question. <clears throat> Ultimately, what the church decided uh, was... Where is it? What the church decided was this. Uh, after everyone spoke, James spoke up. Brothers, he said... Listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. This was the centurion in Acts chapter 10. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, and that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things, things from no, known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. And so right here, it's been settled. If you are a Gentile and you believe in Christ, that's it. You're done. Your faith is sufficient. You don't need to do anything else. And so if we go back to Philippians... This is the very group that Paul is talking about here in this text. These dogs, these evildoers, these mutilators of the flesh are these uh, Judaizers. These people who would do harm to Gentiles. And Paul is saying harm because for him, circumcision is no longer necessary. Now, it is important to note, God, and I think Paul too, I believe this very strongly, would say that being a Jew is not bad. In fact, there's a whole group of Christians today called Messianic Jews. They're, they're Jewish people who have, do largely a lot of the traditions, customs, and practices of Jews, but they believe that Christ was their Savior. And in fact, what Paul would say is, if you're a Jew, you've got to go the whole way. You've got to follow the law. You, there's no exception if you're going to do it. But that's not necessary for Gentiles to take that step. You don't have to do that. And so Paul is opening by encouraging the Philippian church to rejoice in God, to safeguard them against people who would come and deceive them. Because remember, the Judaizers' ultimate point was not just that you have to become a Jew to be Christian, it's that it's the only way to be saved. The only way to find salvation is through some work on earth. And so when Paul says, for it is we who are the circumcision... We who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. What he's saying is, it's we Christians who are considered the circumcision, not those who are circumcised. In Romans, Paul will say, we are not circumcised of the flesh, but of the heart. That you are adopted into the promises and grace of uh, those Old Testament promises through your faith in Jesus alone. You don't need to be physically circumcised because Christ, in saving you, spiritually circumcised you or brought you into these promises and these covenants. And then Paul goes on to say this, though I have many reasons for such confidence. And then he's going to go to list three things that he can boast about if he so chose. First, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. So what he's saying is, my parents did it right. Eight days in, we followed the law of Moses, and I was taken to the temple, dedicated to the Lord, and circumcised. Here's my tribe, here's my lineage. I am as Jewish as it gets. You can't beat me there. In regard to the law, he was a Pharisee. Now, when we hear that, we think that's an insult. That's actually a compliment. Pharisees know the Bible better than I do, at least the Old Testament. They would have had at least the first five books memorized, if not the whole thing. 
They would have been able to receive any passage or section by memory on demand, no questions asked, and they could hold lengthy debates and discussions with one another about how best to interpret Scripture. Pharisees were good people who were concerned about Israel following the law. Because remember, in the exile, in the Old Testament that we talked about when we were going through all the minor prophets, one of uh, Israel's biggest sins was they failed to follow the law by following other gods and not acting in justice towards other people. They would abuse the poor. They would take advantage of those who were weak and defenseless. And so now the Pharisees, almost as if an extreme reaction against that, have actually created additional laws that don't exist in the Old Testament because they just want to make sure. You know, if it says that you shouldn't work on the Sabbath, well, you shouldn't even, like, pluck a head of grain to eat and feed yourself. If it says that you shouldn't uh, touch blood, in fact, you probably shouldn't even help someone who's wounded on the side of the road because you don't even want to risk touching blood. Walk around them, like Jesus' example in the Good Samaritan. They put these extra weights and pressures on people to make sure we were going to be a nation of holy people who follow God or else. And so that was the Pharisees. They were effectively pastors. Pastors who were very passionate about what they did. Now, as far as Jesus was concerned, obviously we remember, if you remember Matthew 23, the seven woes to the Pharisees, a lot of those were around the fact that they were hypocritical. In fact, one of Jesus' accusations against them is you require the people to follow all of these extra laws, but you yourselves will not actually do the same work. You won't carry the same burden. You have a different set of standards that is easier for you. You are holy in appearance, but on the inside you are full of sin and pride and arrogance, like dead bones in a tomb. So the Pharisees had problems, of course. But we shouldn't think of the Pharisees in this entirely negative light. In fact, Paul, as a Pharisee, was largely able to do the work he did because of his knowledge of the Old Testament. The New Testament and the entire church is built on the foundation of the promises of God from the Old Testament. That was their scriptures. That was what they had to reference when they were talking to people. And while we have the New Testament today, the New Testament, is, I even just read it from Acts, they're referencing the Old Testament to create works that the New Testament will be built on. It's important to remember that. And many Pharisees joined the church and were not Judaizers. They were on board with Paul and Barnabas and wanted to just help new people come to know Christ. Verse 6, the last thing he says, uh, one of the last things he says is, as, is, as for zeal, persecuting the church. So remember, in the Jewish perspective, which is where these, er- these boasts are coming from, the church was viewed as this evil group of people who were blaspheming the name of God. You would dare suggest that God would make himself human and become a criminal and die for us. That is blasphemy of the highest order. And so Paul, in his zeal for Judaism, persecuted the church because that was what he truly believed was correct. And from a Jewish perspective, it was. Of course, Jesus, meeting Paul on the road to Damascus, had to inform him of other things. And finally, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. So as far as the law is concerned, Paul could find no fault or sin in himself. And so he lays all these things out, and I just want to ask you, what are your accomplishments? The things that you look back on and say, I'm really glad I made that happen. I was able to get that job, or uh, get that house, or build that building, or, or whatever you have. Whatever accomplishment that you think of. That is what Paul is describing. These great wins that become entirely binding for who people are. An example is someone who is a great guitarist. They might hold on to the fact that when someone says, well, who are you? What do you do? It's like, I play the guitar and I'm one of the best in the world. What happens when they get arthritis? Or they get too old and their fingers don't have the strength anymore to hold those strings. Who are they now? They can't be the great guitarist anymore. What happens to Paul? When all of these prides and accomplishments, these things he did as a Jew are now literally garbage, as he'll call them. 
Because what do they matter in light of knowing Christ? All of our great accomplishments are things that we can be proud of. Remember, God gave us gifts, not just spiritual ones, but physical ones and emotional ones, things that we use to help other people around us. Whether we are a shoulder for someone to cry on or we show up and help them fix a problem that they're having or we've just been a friend to someone our entire lives or we raised a family and have kids that we're just desperately proud of and we can't speak highly enough about them. We can be proud of these things. But never let them become who you are or define you as a person. Because if they do, you will be sorely lacking. I strongly believe one of the reasons the empty nest syndrome exists, the the phenomenon that when the last kid leaves the house, the parents are just like, I don't know who my spouse is anymore. I don't know who I am anymore because my entire life for the past 18 plus years has been my children. Which is natural and normal and there's nothing wrong with that. We should never lose sight of who we are. Remember, who we are is Christ, Christ's children first. People who have been saved and loved and cherished by God first. Everything else flows from that. Because it is God who gave us gifts to show kindness and compassion. It is God who gave us gifts to be physically competent or intelligent in the ways that we have been to accomplish the things that we have in our life. God who gave us those gifts. And so we should always give the appropriate praise to God for enabling us to make our accomplishments while also remembering that it is God who makes those accomplishments have value. And that's what Paul says here, verse 7. For whatever were gains for me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. And we're talking about... We're not talking about like, oh, paper and litters around. We're like talking, you just did dishes and there's like food at the bottom of that little dish tray, but you're really tired and you just want to go sit down. And then like three days later, your kitchen sink starts smelling and you go and you look, oh, I didn't clean the little trap out. That's what we're talking about. Disgusting, filthy rags, dirty garbage in the face of knowing Christ. Not that Paul's accomplishments are actually worthless, but in comparison to being saved by God, What does all that stuff matter? Now, Paul uses all of that stuff for his ministry. He's writing this letter based on his knowledge base, his experiences, and his wisdom that God blessed him with. But he is just stressing so much that it doesn't matter what you've done because knowing Christ is just so much greater than all of it. So I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. And it's this last part, I think, that is key to this passage. I want to know Christ, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. First Peter, we talked a lot about suffering for God. and talked about how it's right, normal, and natural to expect this to happen. And this is, I think, the point that Peter was getting at, that Paul wants to drive home here. That participation in his sufferings is part of knowing the power of his resurrection and It's part of becoming like him. And so that somehow, through that, we will attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, that is not to say that you have to suffer in order to know Christ or to be saved. But it is saying that you are going to suffer. And so if we can know and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death... Uh, that, will, that will drive us towards knowing Christ better and towards the resurrection from the dead. What does it mean to become like Christ in his death? Remember, Jesus laid down everything he had. Paul just went through that hymn that I cite all the time. What did Christ do? He did not consider a God, equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Right? So he's not taking what is rightfully his and saying, worship me, I deserve it, which he does because he's God. Instead, he set that aside and said, no, I will become human. 
In fact, I'll become less than human. I'll become a servant. I'm going to become even less than that. I'm going to die. And I'm, not, I'm, in, I'm going to become even less than just dying. I'm going to die on a cross as a criminal, as cursed by God. All because he loves you. And so when we know his suffering and we know what it is like to participate in his sufferings, I think that means that we love self-sacrificially. That we give up our own desires for the sake of someone else. And that is, in, in a sense, a kind of suffering. But also, when we face real suffering, which we all will because it is inevitable, when we face real suffering, we will know that Christ suffered first. And that because Christ suffered first, we don't suffer alone. We actually participate in his sufferings. We are one with Jesus in his sufferings. Paul is stating a desire, a goal that he has. He desperately wants to participate in Christ's sufferings so that he can just taste the beauty and goodness of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And he even says so in the last uh, three verses. He said, I haven't gotten there yet. I've not accomplished this. It's a work in progress, but I'm not going to give up. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, all of my accomplishments and my pride, those don't matter. And instead, I'm going to strain toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He's called all of us in that direction. To know Christ. To strain and work and labor to know Jesus. How do we know Jesus? For Paul, it was this work. Writing these letters, doing his missionary journeys. Ultimately, he would go to, we believe, Spain to work to uh, preach the gospel, come back to Rome, and there would be beheaded for whatever jumped up crimes they could come up with. For us, it might be being a good parent or a neighbor. It might be the work that we did in our lives, working to the best of our ability to love God through being an honest, hard worker. These are just some of the things that we can do to know God and know Christ better. To be a good Christian no matter what, as Peter was imploring us to do. No matter what your circumstances, always love God and love others at the same time. Never sacrifice those things. Because that is how we will get to know Christ better. By leaning into the fruit of the Spirit that He's given us. By cultivating those things, by practicing and training and relying on God, we can know him better. And we will do that by simply just practicing and training and striving to just be the best we can. Through prayer, through scripture reading, we can know Christ better, yes. But it also requires something tangible. You see, when it comes to service, and I've talked about this a couple times, serving or worshiping is not something simply done on a Sunday morning but it's done in our everyday lives. Every morning we wake up, we have an opportunity to worship God through the actions that we take. Every day as we interact with the people around us, we have an opportunity to worship God by showing kindness and compassion and patience. Every day we have an opportunity to know God more by forgiving sins, by challenging people to be better when they open up to us, by praying for one another and comforting one another. We should also strive to know Christ better. To never give up. To not cave and say, well, it must be something that I have to do. It must be something, that I, some box I have to check off. There must be some task required to know Christ more. There's not. You've been saved if you believe and have faith in Jesus. All that is required is that you just respond in obedience. In fact, this is an Old Testament principle. I've read this to you before. We covered it when we went over Micah, but I'm just going to remind you. God brings a case to Israel and says, listen, you are not obeying me. And his response is, what do you want from us? Would you be satisfied with 10,000 rams sacrificed, rivers of olive oil flowing before you? Would you sacrifice if we even just gave up our firstborn children? What would make you happy? Feels like nothing makes you happy. What is, my, what is God's response? Micah tells us in Micah 6.8.
He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Sacrifices, the performative stuff, none of that matters to God if you're not also obedient on the underlying principles in addition. Christ died for our sins, yes, but as Paul tells us in Romans 6, if we continue to sin so that we can continue to enjoy the grace of God, we're not accomplishing anything. That is not why Christ died for us. In fact, when he died for us, he freed us from sin. Why would we continue willingly to live in sin. Rather, we have been freed from sin, so we should now respond in obedience. All of the platitudes, even me standing up here preaching to you, means nothing if my heart is not inwardly obedient in the small, quiet things that happen every day. Do I treat my wife and my son well? Am I kind to my neighbors and strangers when I meet them? Am I a hard worker? And do I do it because I want to be the best that I can for my family and for God? All of my preaching, this holy practice that I do, means nothing if I'm not going to be faithfully obedient to God. It's irrelevant, pointless, and it's a waste of my time. And it'd be a waste of yours too. So we should always, 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 always strive to be obedient in all things. Because that is how we will know Christ more. The accomplishments that we have, we can celebrate them and we can enjoy the fact that we did them as long as it doesn't become who we are, as long as we can always recognize that it is God who enabled us to make that happen, and we give him the proper thanks while enjoying the fruits of our own labor. My wife is about to give birth to our daughter tomorrow. She's worked hard for nine months. She has every right to be proud of how hard she worked to give birth to that child tomorrow. As long as my wife and I know she will, always remembers that it is God who enabled this life to come to us. We can be proud of that little girl. We don't even know her yet. Just like we're proud of Judah. And we have no idea how we've turned him into this screaming, happy child that he is today. But he is. I'm so thankful to God that he has just brought so much noise and joy to our life that we didn't even realize we were missing. I pray to God our daughter's quiet. Two loud kids, I'm so afraid. (laughs) But you know, come what may, we'll figure it out. That's my encouragement to you. Keep your eyes fixed on Christ. Always know that he has enabled you to make the accomplishments that you have done. There's no problem with taking pride in your hard work. Always remember, it was God who made it possible. So give him thanks while you enjoy your own satisfaction. Because that is okay and appropriate. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us. I don't know what else to say, but help us to have that appropriate balance of gratitude to you, but also just peace and happiness in our own hard work. Lord, you know as well as we do, it feels good to work hard. You rested and enjoyed the fruits of your own labor at creation. So there's nothing wrong, surely, with us doing the same. But Lord, help us always to know that it is you who enables this to happen. That we cannot gain our own salvation or holiness or righteousness through our own hard work. Lord, help us to rest easy knowing that we don't have to win that battle. Rather, now we have the easy part of just enjoying the life you've given us. So Lord, help us to enjoy it to the fullest. Help us to be faithful, true, loyal, hardworking, loving, forgiving, and compassionate. Help us to be all the things that Christ was so that we might taste in his resurrection. We might know the beauty of the life that he was given and that we have also been given. Pray that you would bless us all this week. Help us to just be holy, loving people who just want to see the world be a better place one step at a time. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you. It's in your son's holy and precious name that we pray. Amen.